the deaths um, in those homes. We knew that the elderly were in incredibly vulnerable. Um, so we reached out and, and ensured, first and foremost, that they were getting all the resources that they needed. This is very much the same approach as the second wave, and we know it's hitting harder, um, and the elderly are the most vulnerable in that personal care setting. And that was Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller talking about an alarming COVID-19 outbreak in Manitoba's Opaskwaya Cree Nation reported every single resident at the Rod McGillivray Memorial Care Home tested positive for COVID-19. The second wave is a crushing force hitting Indigenous communities across the country. Nunavut is already in a territory-wide lockdown. The territory marked its first cases just this month, with those numbers quickly spiking. COVID-19 is shedding light on long-standing inequalities Indigenous peoples continue to face in Canada. The federal government announced $120 million in funding for communities fighting the pandemic in Saskatchewan and Alberta. What supports are needed and what lessons should our leaders take from COVID-19? Family physician Dr. James Makokis joins me now. Dr. Makokis, thank you for being there um, and, and, you know, thanks for joining us. Tell us what the situation is and why the minister announced today $120 million. Where is that money going and is it going fast enough and soon enough? Thank you so much for having me on the show today. Well, I think it's interesting what we're seeing now in Indigenous nations across the country is really more of a first wave of COVID-19 hitting our nations uh, because uh, uh, individual nations were very proactive in the spring in uh, asserting their sovereignty to their territories and locking down their nations to prevent a lot of movement in and out. And so unfortunately now during the second wave when the rest of the country is experiencing that, many indigenous nations are experiencing a first wave um, that has been very devastating because as we expected, due to the social economic disparities, um, once COVID hits a household, which can be overcrowded with multiple people in it, it's very dis difficult to isolate. And it's very difficult to have proper hygiene um, when many of the nations are still under boil water advisories. Okay, but what kind of help um, can the announcement today and the money that the federal government, the $120 million the federal government is giving uh, the, these Indigenous communities, what kind of help and how fast can it get to the people who need it? Yeah, so again, you know, it's great to receive additional funding. Um, and I think what it signals is that there is a need, but it's also a reactive need to um, a crisis. And as you are probably well aware, there's many crises that continue to exist in Indigenous nations because of inequity. I would imagine that funding is going to go towards isolation centers, um, building isolation centers for nations who don't oftentimes have the capacity to, to house, um, you know, people in multi-family living situations. I know in our nation, as we're going into the winter time, um, you know, drive-through testing is difficult to do outside because it can be quite cold in the winter. And so developing in, uh, buildings that are outside that we can still um, have people come and drive through and be tested for COVID without having to expose um, additional healthcare workers within our health center is a priority. And then the other thing is when people are having to isolate, they can't go to the store to get groceries and it's difficult for transportation. So, um, you know, some of that money I imagine will be used to help people uh, in their isolation periods of 14 days to have food and water and the different things that they need. Yes, but in order, and you said it, um, Dr. McCulkey, in order to isolate, you need a safe place. In order to wash your hands regularly, you need clean and working water. And not everybody has equal access um, to these things that we take for granted. So, you know, it's obviously this pandemic has highlighted it. Do you need more people? Um, do you need more doctors? Um, is there is there something you know that you can tell us concretely that you would need like tomorrow? Yeah, so you know, since the 1980s, when health was transferred to the province and offloaded off a of federal responsibility, which in our treaty promise to health, we were agreed to always have access to health care. Um, the primary health care system across all of the reserves in this country 
basically went away. And so now what we're seeing in the pandemic is an increased need for primary care because people aren't able to access care within their own nations. Oftentimes in Alberta, for example, um, there's maybe less than 10 First Nations that have regular primary care every day of the week. For the rest of them, they have to seek care off of the reserve, which unfortunately the pandemic has highlighted the systemic racism that exists across the country, most notably by Joyce Eshaquan, when our people go to uh, the hospital for care and if they have COVID-19, sometimes what, we're, what we hear is that they're being turned away. So if they can't go to access care in their own nation, and they can't go to access care in the provincially run health system, then where can they go for care? And this is a very problematic thing that we're experiencing as Indigenous physicians, because we know that the lack of primary health care on reserves has existed for decades. And now in the time of pandemic, we need to have um, clinicians who can deliver care and who live and work in the communities. And you think that this money will help for that? No, this is going to be, you know, something that is long term that invest investments need to be made. This money has helped um, bring things like virtual care equipment into the nation. So um, I can see patients, um, you know, virtually and we can look into their ears and throat and things like that. And I can see it on the computer screen. So all of that is helpful. But we need to have investments in primary care in terms of having adequate equipment in health centers, adequate medical staff in health centers, electronic medical records in health centers, all of the things that other um, communities take for granted that don't exist for the most part in on-reserve health centers, which are essentially nursing outposts. Dr. James Makokis, thank you. Thank you for talking to us today, and I wish you a healthy and safe weekend. Thank you. You too.